The title of my sermon this morning is called The Truth About the Jews. Now, when I ask you to hear me out, this is actually a, uh, this is a, this is a really in-depth topic. And it's, it, it turns out it's going to be a two-part sermon. I'm not, there's no way I'm going to get to all of the content this morning. So I ask, maybe you don't normally come back on Sunday night, but um, to come back on Sunday night to hear the conclusion of everything. Because what I'm going to be starting off with this morning, this morning is the truth about the Jews, and this, and this evening is going to be God's chosen people. Okay, and it's important to get both sides of this and both aspects about this. But I want to give you a biblical understanding of the Jews and who they are and how we should relate to them as Christians and how they relate to us and just, just the whole thing. Now, the easy thing to do when any, for anybody out there, because you know, we publish these sermons online, and maybe even someone here, I don't know, to, the easy thing to do is to just ignore the content matter and just forget about what the Bible says and just say, you're an anti-Semite. Because that term gets thrown around these days as if it's nothing. It's like calling somebody a Nazi, yep. right? It's like, uh, hello, you know, the Nazi party and everything that's going on there, that's pretty extreme, but yet, yet people throw their own. Or it's like throwing around the word cult. Oh, you're belonging to cult, and that's a cult, and that's a cult, and everything's a cult. When it's not. And, and, and they throw these terms around. So I guarantee you someone's going to hear this sermon and they're going to say, Pastor Burrs is an anti-Semite. Yep. Okay, and now look. I am not an anti-Semite. If anybody here knows me at all, knows that I don't judge anybody based on their heritage or where they're from or anything like that. I'm not a racist. You know, that stuff doesn't matter. And I'm going to preach to you tonight that, that the, you know, where, where the person comes from, that doesn't matter to God either. Amen. Okay, our heritage doesn't matter. But there is a group of people who are, who are called the Jews in the Bible, specifically. I mean, and really, that's what you know, the Bible encompasses the Jews pretty much from front to cut, from beginning to end. I mean, that's, that's what uh, they, they are, you know, intrinsic to the Bible. But we're going to look at this and see, you know, just a little bit of history. When we're talking about Jews, just where the name Jew even comes from. It comes from the people who lived in Judea or in Judah, in the tribe of Judah. There's the, the, the two kingdoms of Israel. It started off as one kingdom with, uh, you know, in the days of the judges, after the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they were led into the promised land, they inherited the land. They were all one people. They had the time of the judges, they rejected the judges, they rejected God, they wanted a king over them. We had King Saul, we had King David, we had King Solomon, and then Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Because of Solomon's sins... Basically, because he turned away from God, God decided to strip the kingdom away from him and basically split it up into two because for David's sake, he left a remnant. He left one small portion of the entire nation of Israel to be, to be uh, ruled over by his, by his line. But I don't want to go over this too much. So you have Judea, you have Israel. Israel was generally much more wicked than Judah. Just when you look through the whole history of the kings and everything that they did, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was the first king of Israel after the split. And he set up these, fa these, these false gods and, and these idols. And that just kind of set the pace for the rest of their existence as a nation. And that was a horrible sin in the sight of God. And he got people to stop following the Lord, basically. And uh, they ended up getting taken over by Assyria. And they were held, taken captive. And what happened with that northern kingdom of Israel, they never were returned. So like the southern kingdom of Judah, they, got taken, they were taken captive by Babylon, but then they returned back into the land after 70 years. So the, the northern kingdom of Israel, they got taken over and that was it. And they got spread abroad and they intermingled with the, with the heathen. And basically what they became known as is the Samaritans. So when you, read, you, know, you know the story of the good Samaritan? In the Bible, the Samaritan is someone who is from that northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, and the Jews were the people of that southern kingdom from Judea who had kept their genealogy. They maintained their genealogy throughout their captivity in Babylon and then returned back to their land and were, you know, pure or whatever, however you want to call it. Right? I'm not saying they're all, you know, perfectly pure, whatever. The way that they dealt with it, they got back into their land and they reestablished Judah. Okay? And most of what I'm really going to be focusing on this morning 
is New Testament references to the Jews. Okay, because that's what's most pertinent to us. We have the whole history going through. We're not going to get into all of that. Now, the Bible also, and keep this, excuse me, keep this in mind as we go through all of my text verses. A reference to the Jews can have multiple meanings. It could be talking about the physical inhabitants of the land, but it could also be talking about the religion. The people who were uh, basically of Judaism, right? So today, and, and what I'm going to be focusing on is the religion, not just where you were born from. And that's why I'm just, I just want to make that clear right off the bat because I'm going to start using the term the Jews. And I want you to know what I'm referring to and what I'm talking about. And just to show you, even from the Old Testament, you don't have to turn there, but in Esther chapter 8, um, if you know the story, if you've read the book of Esther, with Mordecai and, and King Ahasuerus and, you know, and, and, and Queen Esther. In, eight, in Esther 8.17, this was right near the end of the story when the Jews are finally going to get their victory over their enemies that were going to slaughter them and kill them. The Bible says, And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day, and many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. This is what I'm talking about. So the people of the land became Jews. They weren't naturally born into that. They became a Jew. So this is the people of the land. They weren't Hebrews by their ancestry, but they became Jews. Why? Because they decided to follow the Lord. Because they saw the might and the power that the Lord had and that the Lord was the true God and that they became Jews. Now, in the Old Testament, being a Jew with that religion, with that faith, wasn't a bad thing as long as they're just following the Lord. Right. That was the right religion. You know, people say, oh, Christianity is a new religion. You know, it's only been around for a couple thousand years. And I say, no, it's not. No. Maybe under the name Christianity, sure. But the religion has been around since Adam and Eve in the garden. Amen. Because it's the same Lord. It's the same God that's been around. And people have been taught to worship the one true God all throughout history. And that religion has been around. You could call it whatever you want, but that religion has been around forever. This is the oldest religion that we are practicing right now. Amen. <clears throat> but one of the reasons why I'm preaching this sermon this morning is because today we have a lot of people that try to lump Jews in with Christianity. And they, try to, they, they come up with this phrase, you know, this Judeo-Christian thing. And I'll tell you what, we are not Judeo-Christian. It's funny, we, I, I drive by, there's this new church, it's called New Life. New Life Church over off of uh, Long Look, where you have, there's like a whole row of, of churches kind of right next to each other. And for a long time, I think they've been sharing the church with, some, with another church. And I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on over there, but just recently they put up this sign. And they've got like three crosses, they've got like a heart and then they have the, the Star of Remphan, I mean the Star of David, right? Whatever you want to call it. So that, that Jewish star, it's like, you're supposed to be a Christian church. Why, why are you putting up a star that represents Judaism, right? Or Israel up on your sign just broadcasting to everybody that, that you know, what are you? Are you synagogue or are you a church? Are you a Christian church or synagogue? Because I'll tell you what. The Jews, the Judaism religion, rejects Jesus Christ altogether. Right. Now, why is it that if you call it Israel, or if you call them a Jew, that Christians these days are all of a sudden going to say, oh, I have no problem with that, but any other religion that's going to blaspheme Jesus Christ and say, Jesus Christ was not the Savior, Jesus Christ was just some man. In fact, Jesus Christ deserved to die on that cross. You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't like that person very much. You, you wouldn't agree at all with that person. You wouldn't join together and say, hey, we're buddies right. with someone that believed that. But you put the stamp of Judaism, or you put the stamp of Israel on it, now all of a sudden it's just fine. We started off in 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse number 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? 
He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. I've heard so many people say that, oh, the Jews, they, they worship the same God we do. It's just without Jesus Christ. That they are just, it's the same thing. They, yeah, they just don't recognize Jesus as the Savior. As if, first of all, that's some trivial thing, right? That like not recognizing Christ as the Savior is just, oh, it's just some detail. Hello, this is what our entire religion is on, is the fact that Christ paid for our sins. I mean, he's the Savior. He's God in the flesh. But the statement alone isn't even true. They do not worship the same God. They do not worship the Lord. The Bible says right here that they're liars if they deny that Jesus is the Christ. Now, I'll tell you what, out of all the religions of the world... Judaism is the one religion, the one religion that's going to say there is a Savior coming from God. And Jesus is not that Savior. And Jesus was, you know, I mean, when you really get, and they don't like to talk about this very much because Christianity is so popular. And they don't want to just offend tons of Christians. But all throughout history, and even now, and I've talked to a couple, if you could even get someone who's Jewish to talk to you at the door, good luck with that. Yeah. That is extremely difficult. Now look, we try to get them saved, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. That's why we're out soul winning. I don't look at someone's skin color or where I think they're from or their accent and say, nope, I'm not going to give you the gospel. Of course not. God loves them. God wants them all to get saved. But we're dealing with reality here. We're dealing with a religion that teaches people that Christ is not the Savior. That Christ, you know, he, he claimed to be the Savior, but he's not the Savior. Now think about this. How would you think about somebody? I mean, there's plenty of antichrists out there even today. What do you think about the guys that say, I'm the second coming of Jesus Christ? They're wicked. They're abominable, right? Well, this is the way that the Jews think about Jesus Christ. It's the same exact way that they picture him. Now, Jesus Christ, we know, is the Savior. But this is how they think of Christ. So, they would have no reason to yoke up with Christians other than just for their own benefit, for some reason. You know, if they could use you to, to, to get ahead. But the Bible says here in verse 23, I don't want to get too far off on, on the point I was trying to make. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. They don't have the Father. They don't have the Father without the Son. The Bible says here, they can't have the Father without the Son. Because if you deny the Son, you deny the Father. Amen. You cannot have one without the other. They're inseparable. And if, you're, if you claim to worship God the Father but not God the Son, you don't have either of them. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. <clears throat> Just one more little piece of evidence that... And, and, you know, this is talking about the Jews from, from the time of Jesus, right? But there really isn't much different. Jesus was constantly telling the Pharisees and the Sadducees to say that you, you know, basically that they observe the commandments of men more than the commandments of God. And when you look at the Jewish religion, that's exactly what you're going to find because now they have the Talmud, right? They supposedly believe in the Torah, which is Moses, the, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are the books of Moses, right? The books that Moses wrote down. They claim to believe that those books are the law. But then they also have their Talmud. Now their Talmud is just a, a collection. There's, I don't even know how many volumes there are. It's like an encyclopedia. There's like 20-something volumes of the Talmud that, that are all these collections from various rabbis and teachers. And even in order to understand it, you need to be taught and trained by these, you know, these theologian rabbis in order to understand what they're saying at all. 
and they say it's extremely complicated, it's really difficult to, to understand anything. It's not for the common person to even understand that you just have to be told what to believe. And what they do with their Talmud is they, they put the commandments of men and their own doctrines and their own thoughts and whatever they want to put out there as above the words of God. And Jesus himself even said, look at verse number 45 of John chapter 5. This is what Jesus said to them. It's right near the end of chapter 5. The last three verses. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. Right? They claim to believe in Moses. They claim to believe in the Mosaic Law. But they don't. He's saying Moses is going to accuse you. The one who you say you trust in. Verse 45, 46. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he wrote of me, saying, if you really did believe Moses, you don't believe him, if you really did believe him, then you'd be believing me right now because Moses prophesied of me. Moses is the one that wrote of me to come. Obviously, you don't believe him because you're not believing me. Verse 47, look at this. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Jesus told him flat out, you don't believe Moses. Now, we know that Jesus isn't a liar. Jesus is saying here to the Jews, which in the context, and we're going to get to that here in just a minute, we're going to go back up. Actually, go back up, you would. We're going to look at verse number 10 because this is the context. We have verses, you know, basically 19 through 47 is Jesus Christ speaking that entire time. This is, this is a long thing that he's going into. But um, he's, his, his direct, uh, the people he's speaking to here is the Jews. Now look at... Um, <coughs> I'm going to bring up many references here, but we're still in John chapter 5. I want to answer this right off the bat because we're going to see how the Jews are depicted in the Bible. And I don't want people saying, oh, it's not fair to group the Jews together. Well, the Bible groups the Jews together. So if the Bible does it, then I'm going to do it too. Amen. Now, this is also with the understanding, because the Bible teaches us also that there is a remnant, there are some individuals, there are some people that get saved, there are some people who do not fall into this category that have the same ancestry. But when we're talking about the Jews, you could lump them together. And it's, when you're talking about the religion, it all, I mean, it all works. This is the religion of the Jews. They are Antichrist. But over and over again, we're going to see the Bible refer to the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. So we're going to see the truth about the Jews this morning. Look at verse number 10 in John chapter 5. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Look at verse 16. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. Who persecuted Jesus according to this verse? The Jews. Right? I mean... That's what it says. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him. Slay means to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. He healed a man. He made him whole and they want to kill him because they think that he's, you know, breaking the Sabbath. Remember, they claim to believe in Moses' law, but they don't. They don't understand the law at all. If they did understand it, they wouldn't be trying to kill Jesus for healing somebody on the Sabbath. Look at verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. They saw what Jesus was claiming here. He was claiming to be the son of God, which made him equal with God, being his son. They understood that. I don't understand why people don't understand that today. We have the, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. People say, oh, yeah, no, he's not really God. He said he's the son of God. That makes him equal with God. He was God in the flesh. 
But the Jews, saw, again, the, the lump together, the Jews sought to kill him. Flip over to uh, John chapter 7. And we're going to stay in John for a little while here. John chapter 7, verse number 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we're going to look at verse number 31. And see, this is where we're going to, where you got to look at the context and understand what's going on because he's going to refer to Jews, but he's going to single out certain Jews here. Look at verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So he's singling out certain people that, that were of the Jews, but then they believed on Jesus, right? This happens, and we're not denying this at all. But there is a group, and you can deal with groups as groups. I mean, you deal with nations as nations. You deal with a group of people. You deal with a church as a church. You deal with a group as a group. And there's a group of the Jews that, yeah, there were some that came out and believed on him. But by and large, that's not the case. And we're going to see what the Jews are doing. And the Jews still exist today that had the same exact beliefs that they had back then. Let's keep reading here, though, in verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed. Now pay attention to this, because he's saying, and, and this is the context is important. What's he referring to? He's referring to Abraham's seed in two different ways in just the next couple verses. First, he starts off saying, I know that you're Abraham's seed, talking about physically descended from Abraham. I know your heritage. I know that you're Abraham's seed. But look at what he says. But ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Verse 38. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. So right after he said, I know you're Abraham's seed, he says, if you were Abraham's children, you'd be doing the works of Abraham. So he just says, you're not Abraham's children, right? Before that, he said you are, and now he's saying you're not. Why? Because physically they are. Yeah, of course. But who cares about that? Because they're not doing anything that Abraham did. Verse 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So now they're claiming God as their father. Verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. So they claim to be children of God. They claim to be children of Abraham. And basically Jesus is saying, Is you're neither. Why? Look at verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Verse 44. Ye are of your father, the devil. He comes right out and says it. He says, You're of Satan. Jesus Christ called the Jews children of the devil. Right. Look, this is Bible, folks. Amen. Why is it that this is such a hard concept to grasp? Yet this is something that's extremely difficult that people don't want to see the truth on, that we've actually had somebody just leave our church over last week as a result of what the Bible teaches about this. Now look, we don't hide this, and I will not hide this from anybody because everyone needs to hear this. It's up to you to decide if you can handle what the Bible says or not. Amen. I was a little bit taken aback, and I don't want to make a big deal out of this. And you know what? The person that, that, that left, I love the guy, and I hope he comes back. I really do. I honestly mean that. I mean, I have no problems with him whatsoever. He decided to leave because of this doctrine. But I realized, you know what? I haven't even hit this subject in a long time. We have the DVDs back there called Marching to Zion, which I'm in. And that was the, you know, you know I was asked, well, do you believe this? And I said, well, yeah, uh, of course I believe this. I'm in it. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm making an appearance in this film and, and we're promoting it and we're giving it away for free to everyone that comes into this church. Yes, I believe that. 
And, and that was enough for him to go. So I was like, I was a little taken aback. Now, I already know that I believe everything in it. I've, I've watched the, the film multiple times. But just, it's been so long, like I just I haven't watched a while, so I just, I plugged it in and I'm looking at him just like, how could this make anybody leave a church? You know, I'm, I'm just looking at it like the scripture's so clear and it's so well presented and so well laid out. It's like, I can't even argue with someone like that because if this doesn't convince you, I mean, I don't know what will. Some people I think are just willfully ignorant yeah. because they don't want to accept what the Bible's saying here. But you cannot get, look, we, he said, you are of the devil. You're of your father, the devil. And he's talking to the people who he is calling the Jews. can't get around it. You are your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Turn if you would to John chapter 9. John chapter 9 verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put to death, or he should, excuse me, he should be put out of the synagogue. Now, confess that he was Christ, referring to Jesus, that Jesus was Christ. So if anyone, you know, in those days, anyone who was going to the synagogue, if they said, hey, we found the Christ, it's right here, it's this Jesus, then they were, they were going to be ousted. Why? Because the Jews we're controlling the synagogues and kicking people out. Verse, uh, look at chapter 10. We're, I mean, we're going to flip through. I just, want, I just want you to see all these. It's not, I'm not cherry picking, okay? In fact, when I started preparing this, because I was just going to preach one sermon just on this subject, I ended up with 11 pages of Scripture. Just notes of Scripture. And I was, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this isn't going to be one sermon. So I had to split it up into two. And actually, the point that I'm making this morning was going to be my last point for the whole sermon, which is why I'm encouraging you to come back tonight to see there's a lot more involved on this. But we, we need to get a proper understanding Amen. and a proper viewpoint when we're dealing with the Jews. Okay? They are enemies. But they are not, it's not that we don't love them and want to give them saved. Right. Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a key to understand that. They are completely anti-Christian. They are against the Bible. They are against Jesus Christ, therefore making them our enemies. Okay? But we are not going to just withhold the gospel from them and hate them. We're going to love them and still preach them the gospel and try to get them saved. And that's the best, that's, I mean... It's the best thing you do for anybody, regardless of where they're from or what their religion is. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 31, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Again, the Jews took up stones to stone him. John 11, verse number 8. John 11, 8. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? His disciples are saying, Look, the Jews are trying to kill you. Who is it? The Jews. John chapter 19. Look at John chapter 19. Verse number 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Verse number 12. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Jesus, to Caesar. Now look, the Jews killed Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, uh, there's been a campaign to try to teach people that, no, 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 it wasn't the Jews. People say, oh no, the Romans did it, or the Pharisees did it. But it wasn't just the Pharisees. And it wasn't, the Romans were just the instrument that was used in the death of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's really just the hand, you know, the, the, that judgment that was used. But, but the people, because even here, we, you know, Caesar was a Roman, he wanted to let, or, or um, not Caesar, Pilate. Pilate was a Roman. Pilate was a Roman governor. He didn't want to put Jesus to death. That was not his will. It's not what he wanted to do. Basically, he's a politician and he succumbed to some mob that was there telling him to execute Jesus. And you know who the mob was? The Jews. Right. So where does the responsibility go? 
It goes on the Jews. It's like, you know, we hold, you know, Charles Manson. Is he still alive? I, I think I saw him in the news again for some reason. The guy was convicted of murder, yet his hand didn't go out and commit those, those killings, you know, with his own hands. But why was he convicted of murder? Because he was responsible for it, because he's the one who mastermind, he's the one who sent the people out and had control over the people to go and do his will and do his bidding. Who's considered the victor in a war? You know, you, you think about the wars, you hear about these generals, right? Ulysses S. Grant and, and, uh, and Lee, right? You, you have these people, they're considered the victors, they don't even necessarily have to be doing any of the fighting. Why? Because they're the ones planning and sending out the people and responsible for the victory or the defeat. I mean, this is, this is an easy concept to get. The Jews are the ones who are responsible for killing Jesus, but if that's not good enough to help you understand, look, if you would, at Acts chapter 10. We're just going to see biblical evidence of this and proof where the Bible flat out says it. People trying to whitewash this to get Christians to just accept Judaism and to call themselves Judeo-Christian and just yoke up with these anti-Christ Jews. It's unbelievable. Acts chapter 10, look at verse number 38. Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Look, he's talking about Jesus. He went about doing good. He went about healing people. He went about because God was with him. Look at verse 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Who's they? Well, the only group mentioned here is the Jews. When he says, in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Let's get a little bit more clearer. Turn back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse number 22. Ye men of Israel. So wait, who's he talking to? The men of Israel. Ye men of Israel, also known as Jews. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken. Who's ye? Ye men of Israel. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. The blame is going to the men of Israel. They have crucified and slain him, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Jump down to verse number 36. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who crucified him? All the habits of Israel, the, the, the Jews. Okay, Acts chapter 3, flip over to chapter 3. Verse number 12, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel. Again, the crowd is the same. He's talking to the same people. Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One. And the just, who's that? Jesus. You denied him and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it. Look at this. As did also your rulers. He's talking to the multitude of Israel, of the Jews, and he says that you did it as your rulers did also. So the people are trying to say, oh, it was just the rulers, it was just the Pharisees that, that were responsible for killing Jesus. No, it's not, because he's lumping in the whole group with the rulers, as did also your rulers. 
Uh, you don't have to turn there. Stay in the book of Acts. We're going to be going to Acts chapter 9 next. Uh, I'm going to read for you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Just one more, I mean, just one more clear scripture that's, that identifies the Jews as being the ones that killed Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea, are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins all way, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. And notice that it says, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Why? Because the Jews at that time were racist. Because they believed that they were superior to all of the other races. And we see that in Scripture also. If you go back, my very first Bible study from this, when the church started was through the book of Acts. Because it's my favorite book of the whole Bible. I love watching the Acts and all the exciting things that they were doing. But when you go through like literally almost every single chapter in the book of Acts, do you know what you're going to find? And we're going to see this. I'm going to try to get real quick through these verses. And I, I, I stopped just writing them down just so that, you know, I don't belabor the point too much. You see the Jews persecuting the Christians. You see the Jews persecuting anybody who's of Christ. You see the Jews, you know, and even amongst the disciples. There's an example of the Apostle Peter who got up and dissembled when, when, uh, you know, when the Jews came down. He was, he was an apostle. He was doing right. He knew the truth. He was eating with the Gentiles. He was commun communing with them as he should have because there's no problem because there is no difference. There is, you know, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. It doesn't matter. But when the Jews came down, he got up and he walked away and didn't have anything to do with the Gentiles. And Paul had to rebuke him to his face and say, you're wrong, Peter. Why? Now, Peter got just... He made, a, he made a dumb mistake, but that's the way their culture was. That was ingrained in them as the Jews to not have any dealings with people of another nation. And even Peter himself was told when, uh, when he was told to go to Cornelius. And he had, he had this vision. And he wouldn't have even gone unto him except he had the vision from God basically telling him to go. Why? They were Italians. They were Gentiles. And he would have had no dealings with them. But that was wrong, and he shouldn't have been. And God had to tell him, look, Peter, you know, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common or unclean. So he was told to do that, but that was, that was part of who they were. They had this superiority, and think about it. When you start thinking that you're the chosen people, I'm God's, I'm God's person, you know, I'm, I'm God's child. I'm, God chose me. They let that get to their heads. And I'm going to explain the, you know, the reason why they were chosen and what that even means and everything else tonight. It is not make them some super person, which people today, I mean, Christians today are like, oh, you're a Jew? Oh, great. you know, like, and fall over themselves, wanting to bless them and kiss their toe and whatever else because they're physically descended from Abraham, supposedly. It means nothing. It means less than nothing. You're in Acts chapter 9. I'm going I'm to try to blow through. You try to keep up with me. I'm just going to be going through kind of sequentially through the book of Acts. I've got a few places. And we're just going to see again the references to the Jews as a group and how they're persecuting Christians. Okay, this is, this is the point of this. Acts 9, verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. So this is just after Saul's conversion, the apostle Paul. And he's proving that Jesus is a Christ. Verse 23, And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying and laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Acts chapter 13. Acts 13, verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken of Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Uh, jump down to verse number 50. Verse 50, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. You're going to find this, that they're going to be 
persecuting them, getting other people pitted against them, getting the people in high places, the people who have money, the people who have power to just persecute and go after Paul, go after the apostles, go after anybody who's preaching Jesus Christ. And they don't even just leave them at that. They follow them to other cities. Look at verse number, or chapter 14, verse number 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. So they're doing a great work for God. They're getting people saved. Even they're getting the Jews saved. Verse 2, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Jump down to verse 19, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. So they literally stoned Paul and they thought they stoned him to death and they drug him out of the city. Chapter 17. Chapter 17. But the Jews which believe not, verse 5. But the Jews which believe not moved with envy took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Verse 13, But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. They, I mean, they were relentless in their persecution of the apostles because they're like, they're, we got them out of our city. Oh, wait, he's preaching over there? We're going to go over there and take care of them over there, too. Right. I mean, they would not stop. Right. Chapter 18, verse number 12. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. And that's, look, you go on and on and on and on throughout the book of Acts. This is the pattern you're going to see. And it's interesting because it's always referred to as the Jews. It's never this person or this Pharisee. It's the Jews as a whole, which is why I'm preaching on the Jews this morning, that we get this in our heads, that this is the context, this is what the Bible's saying, and this is what we need to learn, that that wicked religion is, is, is just that. It's wicked. Yeah. And they're not friends of Christianity. They're not friends of the gospel at all. Amen. And just one more point, because I have this at this point in my notes, when you, you know, read through the book of Acts and, the, and the, the feeling of superiority that they had over other people, even that still exists today. Now, it may not be through every, again, it's not every single physical seed of Abraham that I'm talking about. I'm talking to people about this wicked religion, you know, these, these, these hardcore, you know, Jews. And, uh, it's interesting to look up goy or goyim because that's, the, that's the, the Hebrew word for basically any non-Jew is what that is. And you look at, there's, there's tons of videos out there. There's lots of, lots of information out there of how the Jews, again, the same context that the Bible refers to them as, view goyim and how it's okay for them to use them. It's okay for them to abuse them. It's, you know, this is what's taught in the Talmud. Right. That look, if you could, you, it's okay for you to steal from these people because they're basically subhuman. Mm -hmm. They're not important like you are, so you do whatever you can do, and, and you know, and, and it's just fine. It's not a sin when you sin against the goyim. That's what's taught as the the the, the doctrines of men, as the commandments of God. That's what that's what they teach. Now, does every single Jew believe that? No. Does every single Christian believe the Bible? No. But if we're looking at the source, I mean, the, and, and look, the people that, that really believe, the people who really believe the Bible, you're going to find most of the time are going to be the ones doing the work. They're going to be the ones proselytizing. The ones that really believe the, the Talmud and their Judaic re religion are going to be the ones that we're talking about here. That really, I mean, that really have that belief. They're going to be the ones who are the children of the devil. Now, the rest of them, we're trying to get saved. Right? Anyone who's not a child of Satan, we're trying to get saved. But we need to be aware of this and what's behind that false religion. Turn, if you would, to Revelation. Last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 2. We're almost done. Actually, I'm doing a lot better than I thought I'd be doing at this point in the sermon. Revelation chapter 2. Not making any promises. I'm getting out early tonight, though. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2. And 
And I want to spend a lot of time on this, and I have two sermons, and I could do even more. There's so much content, there's so much doctrine to learn, but, but it's important, and it's important because there's been so much brainwashing going on right. just with, with how we need to you know, view this subject and, and, and everything else. It, you know, I'm, my goal is not to be offensive, but to teach the Bible. And if you think that I'm pulling something out of context, you know, show it to me. And try to explain to me what the context really is then. Because I don't see it. I, I've seen tons of scripture. I've already given you lots and lots and lots of verses from the Bible. If you, if you disagree with me, and, and see, I would have liked to hear from the person that left what was wrong. I didn't hear that. It was just, it's wrong. Why? Prove it from scripture. And look, I'm open. Okay, I'm very solid on, on my convictions on a lot of things, but if you got scripture to bring me, I will look at the scripture. And if you could prove something to me from scripture, I'll believe what the Bible says. Amen. So, you know, any disagreement, you know, if, and this stands for anything that, preach, you know, everyone here may just be completely in agreement and say, you know what, Pastor Burton, this is right, I agree with you. But if there's something that I preach or teach at some point and you say, I don't think Pastor Burton is right about this, Bring it to me, but don't just say you're wrong. Give me some evidence from the Bible of why I'm wrong. And show me, because I'll be honest with you, if I'm wrong, I want to change. I don't want to be wrong about my beliefs. Now, I already know that I'm not perfect, so I'm, I'm probably wrong on something, but I try not to do it on, on things that I actually teach from the pulpit. I make sure that I'm pretty solid on what I'm, you know, if I'm not solid on something, I'm not going to be teaching it to you because I'm not solid. I'm only going to be teaching the stuff that, no, I know this. But even then, I'm not infallible by any means. So please, by all means, show me from Scripture where I'm wrong. I, and I'd like to see that. And just keep that in mind. And, and don't feel like you can't approach me. And don't feel like your only solution is just leaving the church. At least give me the, the courtesy, especially if you're coming here for any length of time, to have a conversation about it and see, you know, and if at the end of the day we're still, you know, a disagreement and I say no, it's the way it is, and, and you say no, you're wrong, and, and you feel it's so important you need to leave, fine, but at least, you know, have that opportunity to go through the scripture. Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, look at verse number 9 in both of those chapters. Verse number, chapter 2, verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan in chapter 3 verse 9 is almost the same thing. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. And a lot of people say all kinds of different things about who are these people that say they're Jews and are not. Look, it's not difficult at all. It's very, very simple. First of all, how many people are out there saying they're Jews today? Not very many. Not very many people out there claiming to be Jews. There's people out there that claim to be Jews and are not. And then it says, but they're of the synagogue of Satan. How many religions have synagogues? I know of one. I know of a religion that has mosques. I know of religions that have churches. I know of religions that, you know, that, that don't have any of those things. There's one religion that has synagogues. It's Judaism. And Jesus is saying that they're of the synagogue of Satan. Why? Because they're part of a synagogue. They say they're Jews, but they're not. And we're going to get into that a lot more tonight when I go into God's chosen people and, and who is a Jew and who's not a Jew. See, I alluded to it earlier. We saw this, the passage where Jesus said that I know you're Abraham's seed physically, but you're not Abraham's children. You're of your father, the devil. You're not children of God. These are the same people. They're of the synagogue of Satan. They're not, they, they say they're Jews, but they're not really Jews. They're not really God's chosen people. That's, that's meaningless for them. Why? Because they have their false antichrist belief. And if you've seen the references to Jesus in the Talmud, I've got a book by um, Peter Schaefer, who was a... Uh, uh, a uh, professor at a college, I don't remember exactly where he was, but he, um, he's a Jewish professor of Jewish studies, and, and he wanted to be honest about what the Talmud actually says about Jesus Christ. And 
there are passages that say, and look, in the Talmud, is, is, uh, it's not as clear as, as the Bible is. Like the Bible has a lot of statements. I mean, it's just, just flat out there. The, the, the Talmud has a little bit more cryptic sayings. But this is someone who understood the Talmud and, and, was, and was teaching it. Okay? And when you look at it, it's not like it's some big stretch either. They just use, sometimes they just use different names to refer to who they're really talking about. But when you look at the context, and I read the book and I saw all the excerpts from the, from the Talmud, it's disgusting. And basically what it says is that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh who died on the cross and rose again to pay for all of our sins, is boiling in hot excrement right now as a punishment for doing what he did on this earth. That's what the Talmud says about Jesus Christ. And when you see those types of reverences and those types of beliefs, you can understand why it's called the synagogue of Satan. Because it's a satanic religion. And when you see the hatred that the Jews have had historically for Jesus Christ, and then you realize that that hatred is still there even today, it is. It, it's more, it's more, it's, it's veiled more. Again, just because of the, the dominance and popularity of Christianity as a whole in general, especially by the nations that claim to be Christian nations like the United States and the power that the United States has, the contempt for Jesus Christ is a little bit more veiled. But it's still there, and it's still underlying in that religion of Judaism. And when, but when you see that, it's a lot easier to see how one group of people, one group, right, as a whole, again, we're not, we're not talking about any one individual here or there, but the group of people can be behind so much wickedness. And you hear the, you know, the conspiracy theories. But it's not even all conspiracy theories. I mean, look at Hollywood. Look at the filth and the smut and the garbage being put out by Hollywood, and you know who's, who's mainly in charge of Hollywood? The Jews. Right. You look at even 9-11, you know, right? We know that 9-11 was a false flag. We know that there is the way, what, we're, what we've been told is not accurate. And I don't even believe the, the stuff that's come out that's, that's been unredacted. I don't even think that's pointing to the, to the actual source anyways. There's a lot of people, I've seen a lot of evidence that Israel was behind that also. Now, do I know that for a fact? I don't. But when you start seeing their hatred for this, you start, you start saying, well, that's not that far of a stretch to, to see one group of people. They're already doing these things. You know, and the wars and the financing and the banking and everything else and the power associated with the Jews. You start seeing this stuff. You see it throughout the Bible. That's not a big stretch. It actually makes sense. For those who, who read and study the Bible and see this has been the pattern, the, le the, the predatory lending, the, you know, the, the power structure, everything that has been going on through history, it all lines up and makes perfect sense. Now, and again, this has nothing to do with a genealogy, but a wicked, Christ-rejecting, Christ-hating religion. That's the mindset that it puts them in. That's what, what makes them capable of just doing all this filth and wickedness, because they're anti-Christ. 2 John chapter 1. Turn, if you would, to 2 John chapter 1. It's the last place I'll have you turn this morning. 2 John chapter 1. Right near the end of the you're in Revelation, just go back a few pages. Literally, just a few pages to the left from where you were in Revelation. 2 John, verse number 7. Because people today are going as far as to say we should be blessing Israel. Like we should be, and, and I'm going to go into that a little bit, like a lot more tonight also, because they'll claim, you know, the, the covenant made to Abraham, if you, you know, God's going to bless those that bless Israel and curse those that curse Israel. It's a bunch of nonsense. Come tonight. I'm going to go through that and expose that tonight. But even just from what we've seen this morning, 2 John, look at verse number 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Do the Jews confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? No. What are they? Deceivers. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look at 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ... He hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. 
He's referring to people who don't confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He's saying they're a deceiver. They're an antichrist. And he says, look, this is the doctrine if you have the doctrine of Christ. If you don't have the doctrine of Christ, then you don't have God. And if anybody comes to you and they don't have that doctrine, he says, don't bless them. Don't bid them Godspeed. Because when you're bidding someone Godspeed, you're blessing that person. It's basically saying, like, God be with you. God, God expedite whatever it is that you're doing. That's what Godspeed is. God be with you. God help you. Those are blessings. Don't bid him God's speed. Because if you do that, then you are now making yourself a partaker of what it is that they're doing that's wicked. Right. So should we be blessing Israel and the Christ-rejecting religion of Judaism? No. You're if you decide to do that, you're making yourself partaker with their evil deeds. That's right. It's exactly what you're doing. It's clear that the Bible, that the people the Bible refers to as the Jews in all these passages that we've been looking up were clearly the enemies of Christ. How have we come to call these same people that still reject Christ God's people? They're not God's people. But, you know, I'm going to close with this. Romans 10.1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. This is the same attitude that we need to have also. Amen. I am not preaching this sermon to garner just hatred against a physical group of people, someone who is some descendant of Abraham or whatever, someone who's from a nation. That's not the point of the sermon at all. Amen. It's one to show you the, wicked, the extreme wickedness of the religion and anyone who adheres to Judaism as being enemies. They're enemies of the gospel. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. They are enemies and they are working against us. But I don't want it to get so far into this crazy, you know, like, like believe me, this is really far from, from Hitler's solution, right? This is not what we're talking about at all. Right. We are not in a physical battle and we're not fighting physical you know, descendants of, you know, of anything. It's not genocide or anything like that. Not even close to it. Amen. What our attitude is, is know who the enemy is. Know the attacks are coming. We're not going to be embracing them and loving them and saying that, you know, like you're our buddy and we're going to yoke up with Jews. We're going to know who they are. We're going to market, identify them. But we're going to go out and preach the gospel. And we're going to preach the truth of Jesus Christ. And you know what? My desire for Israel is that they might be saved. Amen. I'm not going to elevate them above any other country. I'm not going to devote all of my time to trying to get Israel saved. But I'm also not going to detract from it. Just, you know what? They're just like anybody else. I'm going to try to give them the gospel. If they reject it, then they reject it. It's on them. But know that it's, it is difficult. They, they are a group of people that is the most difficult in my see seven eight nine ten years experience now going out soul winning of trying to get saved trying to even speak and get out any verse from the bible to someone who identifies themselves as a jew as in their jewish religion i think i might have spoken to two people in 10 years of going out and knocking doors on a weekly basis I think it's been, I'm trying to recall now, I could remember, and one vividly comes to mind that was up here within the past three years, where I actually had a pretty significant conversation. But even that, it wasn't even long enough of a conversation to really get the whole gospel out to that person. That's the, but this is what that, that anti-Christ religion has done and has hardened hearts. And this is what happens when a people... Hey, just completely reject Jesus Christ. I mean, you look at all the other religions of the world, even Islam, which, and this is in no way an endorsement of Islam by any stretch of the imagination, but they give lip service to Jesus. They'll say, well, yeah, he was a prophet, right? He's not the son of God, but he was a prophet, right? He, he was someone that we could look to. The Jews don't do that. All of the other various religions, they all will give lip service to Jesus Christ as a good guy, as a good man. The Jews say he's burning in hell and excrement. That's a pretty big difference. And this is why you have so much depravity and wickedness coming from that group of people. 
as a whole. That's right. That's where it comes from. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching of the Bible. Lord, help us not to be brainwashed and, and dissuaded from, from the truth by our common, by the world today, by the media today, by those who are in power that control the media, dear Lord, of course, that don't want to paint themselves in a bad light. Lord, help us to just stay true to your words. Help us not to be afraid of being labeled, you know, hateful or whatever. Whatever the world wants to throw at us and try to attack us or persecute us or hurt us, dear Lord. Uh, we, we know that attacks are coming if we're going to be preaching the truth. And I pray that you would please just help us to have the hearts that are able to receive your word as truth. And, and Lord, help us just to... Um, Keep doing the work for you, no matter what comes our way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.